most of you will hopefully be familiar with Andrew. We did an episode uh, with Andrew a little while back, and I should have made a note of the episode number, but I'm uh, sure two, you'll, six, you'll know three. it. 263. 263. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, episode 263, where, and Matthew's already chipped in as well. Um, uh, episode 263, where we talked about uh, Andrew's uh, series of books about Cold War Berlin. So today, what Andrew's going to be doing is he's going to be talking about uh, the books that he is working on, books he's got coming up, but also the, the techniques that he uses to research the books and create some of the content. But um, we welcome any questions you've got for uh, Andrew about the books or any general question about the Cold War. We can we can try and uh, answer that as well. But I'm going to hand you over to uh, Andrew and uh, he will kick off. So over to you, mate. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon and good morning, depending on what time it, what time zone you're in. Um, no, it's very good to be here. Um, I'd like to talk for a few minutes on how and why I came to write my books about the Cold War. Um, and as Ian said, um, I was very happy to do an episode on the uh, wonderful Cold War Conversations podcast that are um, on the building of the Berlin Wall. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to do some more episodes um, uh, there's so much to talk about and it's just so many good stories um, and as keeping the Cold War, um, well, just saving that history, which is what it's all about. So let's just kick off and just give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm an author um, specialising in the Cold War, which of course makes me very, very much at home with the um, uh, the Cold War Conversations podcast. Um, I've had three books published so far. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the um, Secrets of the Cold War, you can see on the um, uh, on the left there, um, is um, published. That was published by Pen and Sword at the end of last year. Um, so it's a, a very much a, a, a new product, a new new book on the shelf. Um, and there's also the first two volumes in a mini series on Cold War Berlin that I'm writing for Helion. And there you have a sneak preview of um, volume three, which is coming out uh, next month. Um, it's not, the cover's not not quite right, but it gives you the general look and feel of what the cover's going to look like. Um, I'm going to talk about mostly secrets of the Cold War during this talk, um, but I'm not going into too much detail um, about the individual stories. Um, it's one of those things that. Uh, you have to read uh, by the book to uh, get the full story. But think of this as the sort of the making of or the bonus content you find on the DVDs or the Blu-rays. Um, it, I'm going to try and give you a bit of background as to the um, what I do when I'm putting my books together, which might be of interest to you all. We shall see. So. Am I a historian? Well, let's be um, I'll be honest, I have to admit that I'm entirely self-taught. Um, I actually gave up studying history after the third year at school. Now, that might not translate uh, uh, to other countries, but it's about the age of 14. Um, yeah, I, I just wasn't interested back in back in, uh, when I was that young. But as I've become older and wiser, I've become quite a history fan and um, I've consumed enough historical nonfiction to know what's required. And I'm a quick learner. Um, but the um, I think it's the techniques that um, people would train a historian on. I've, I've picked up most of the uh, the techniques. The writing um, part has come fairly easily um, as I spent decades writing marketing copy in my previous career, adverts, literature, packaging, whatever. Um, so I simply needed to convert it to a more long form approach. Um, it's been commented on that my writing style is fairly informal, but that, that works for me. It's all about trying to have a good head to deep for detail, trying to explain complicated and, and nuanced situations, but in a um, uh, achievable format that, that's that's hopefully um, easy to read and enjoyable to read, in, you know, packed with facts, but presented in a useful format. So in terms of research, well, I started out realising this was probably about um, eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, I started out realising I didn't know very much about the Cold War. 
Um, so I began reading up on it, um, working with a local museum. I began to sort of write up my research um, and then it dawned on me that I could sort of turn these notes into a book. So I ended up in a supermarket cafe on a cold Friday afternoon in November uh, 2019, pitching my ideas to a couple of publishers. And I was somewhat surprised that both of them said yes. Um, next thing I know, I've been commissioned to write seven books. Um, so we published three. Uh, two will be more. Two will be out this year, and there's a load more in the pipeline. In terms of research, um, my library is ever growing. Um, actually, it's quite a lot of the um, speakers on the Cold War, Cold War Conversation podcasts. I I enjoy the podcast, and I go out and buy the book, and and that really has. Uh, broaden my knowledge it's um it's it's really good so um as well as the books my, my local library has been absolutely fantastic they will generally buy me a, a a copy of a book in um if it's not on their um on their in their stock and i obviously spent hours and hours picking through the internet one thing though i've built up a network of expert contacts all around the world who are exceedingly generous with their time i mean i'm, I'm constantly amazed at how friendly the the um, Cold War community is, the Cold War um, history community is. But they, I've been given a huge amount of information uh, with no um, ex, you know, expectation of return. Um, so I live in the far southwest of the United Kingdom, a uh, long, long way from London, which is where most of the archives are kept. Um, I've made several research, research trips um, up country, as we say down here. Um, but um, I'm lucky that the Americans are really good at digitizing their primary source material so I can access a, an awful lot online. I wish uh, the same could be said about the British, but um, we'll, we'll get there in the end. So one thing I look for, my, look, look for in my research is connections, how individuals and events are interconnected. And it's, it's surprising how many links there are when you start to scratch the surface. I also think very visually, and that might be a legacy of my marketing days, but I tend to map out what I'm discovering. And, and it's this process plus the refine, the constant iteration of refining, refining, refining that reveals the patterns and the connections. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, just take this as an example. This um, uh, this is not the daubings of a demented um, historian. Well, well, it, perhaps it is, but this is a about the fifth or sixth version of a mind map I um, pulled together oh, a couple of years ago um, now while I was writing the chapter in the Secret, Secrets of the Cold War. And it's about the Rosenberg spy ring. I'm sure you will, will all know about the <coughs> atomic spies or know of them. The previous versions of this extended across uh, three or four sheets of A3 paper, all taped together with lines and arrows and, and crossings out and notes and um, marked up in colour. I, I do tend to get through quite a lot of um, post-it notes and highlighter pens. Um, but this helped me map out the relationships and the, and the contacts, the um, the uh, personalities and to a certain degree the flow of, flow of events um, and this was accompanied by a huge word document with detailed biographies I pulled together of all the individuals and um, in in Microsoft Word you can hyperlink information around so I, I use these hyperlinks to, to hardwire these connections into the document so I could fly around all over the place um, and that helped me um, build the picture. The situation with uh, spies is made, or certainly um, spies of this generation, was, was made much more complicated by the myriad of code words and code names used. Um, and also, obviously, spies tended to have different code names throughout their career, which makes tracking them down all the more hard, difficult. And also, um, they were changed for security reasons, or, or if that particular spy changed from uh, KGB um, ownership, if you like, to GIU ownership. So trying to track all these names down um, and and plot the story was quite difficult, but quite uh, entertaining. So if this is the, um, the sort of the, the mad scribbles, well, that's how it ended up in the book. Um, 
so you can see the sort of direct relationship between the uh, uh, the, the mad daubings and um, how it appears on the page. Um, so this shows us the, uh, the, 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 the Rosenberg ring. Um, and then in the conclusion of the book, I take the same diagram, but I annotate it to show the fates of the individual um, participants, if you like. So, um, yeah, that visual approach to uh, writing is quite important for me. There are other clusters that started to appear as well. So again, I I had elaborate um, drawings for them that have congealed into this um, summary of the different connections between the, uh, the the perpetrators, and that you know it makes patterns and that gives me background that I can talk about. One thing I was astounded with. Um, was how extensive Stalin's espionage network was um, and how his spies got their claws into virtually every aspect of American and British society. Um, it was a, a, a masterstroke, to be honest, of, of intelligence gathering. Um, and here's just one particular chart I've, I, I pulled together to just try and plot um, how he went about it. Inevitably, the process required me to understand the history of Soviet intelligence. And that also proved a challenge. Um, basically, the, his agencies changed their name every five minutes, it seems, um, as, I guess, different uh, uh, trends, you know, sort of purges went in, went out, reorganizations, I don't know. But he also introduced this conflict into his, his intelligence services, um, which is a, a, a strange uh, approach that was very Soviet, um, where uh, rival agencies competed for his patronage. The KGB was the uh, natural successor to the Cheka, and here you can see its its progression. This is another diagram from the book. And the GIU was his military one. So this created a competition and rivalry with the, 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 the rival services squab squabbling over who owned a particular agent's agent or a target or a territory. Um, and I know that the KGB would normally claim seniority, but I'm not sure it actually worked that way in the field. Um, it also, this, this the approach adopted um, ensured that his spy masters and agents were always looking over their shoulders, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it also created redundancy, which was quite useful when Stalin was on one of his purges and got rid of a whole um, raft of uh, agents or managers, if you like, um, or when a particular network, network was rolled up, which I describe in the book, um, for example, um, after the end of the Second World War, um, when the Venona decrypts basically collapsed the whole KGB structure within the US, but the GRU was there in the background, able to, to keep things moving forward. So this was this was quite interesting. I mean, it's an example of one of the rabbit holes that I frequently go down. Um, I take a look on a particular subject and I sort of veer off into um, a tangent, which can be time consuming, but it normally yields results. Um, so the Soviet intelligence history was quite an interesting example, um, but I studied Marxism. I decided I, I needed to understand the Soviet mentality, and I sort of looked at um, you know uh, Marx, Engels, back to Hegel, and pe people like that, and how that then got taken on by Lenin, and then Marxism, Lenin, Leninism, and so on and so on, um, and that gave us the perhaps a glimpse of the Soviet men mentality, but also the motivation for some of the spies. Um, I thought it was very important to learn about the Manhattan Project itself, and that was really fascinating. I learned a lot with uh, by doing that. I even tried to get my head around some of the physics. Um, I, I gave up physics at the same time as I gave up history. Um, but the, the technologies um, to understand um, how the bomb was create was built, but also the roles that the different people played within the Manhattan Project and why that was of interest to the Soviets. So. This whole story, this is the whole first chapter in the book, um, extraordinary tale of science, technology, industrial power and espionage. And it's really pivotal to the emergence of the Cold War. So I, I very much enjoyed writing that. So um, am I a geographer? <laughs> so I've asked the question, am I a historian? Well, am, I, am I a geographer as well? Maps are really important in my writing. Um, 
whether it's some seismic geopolitical event um, or just to spot a local bother. Um, I, unfortunately, my skills don't extend to cartography yet, but um, I, I'm lucky that I work with a lot of people who, um, who, who can help me on this front. Um, it took a map, it took studying a map to realise um, with the benefit of hindsight just how obvious Stalin's grand plan was to create this buffer zone between Mother Russia and the imperial, imperialist West. So here's, here's a map of how uh, Europe looked in 1938 um, before the infamous molotov ribbentrop Pact, um, the start of the Second World War and Hitler's disastrous attempt to fight the war on two fronts. Stalin was paranoid, probably with some justification, that the West had designs on his huge resources and open spaces um, in the Soviet Union. So the molotov ribbentrop Pact, I'm sure you all know, was a cynical attempt to buy some time, but Hitler's betrayal of that pact in um, June 1941 with Operation Barbarossa pushed Stalin to the edge of disaster. And um, I didn't realise, I had to look this up yesterday, the Wehrmacht got within about 12 miles of Moscow um, before they ran out of steam and the rest is, as we say, history. Um, but all this fueled Stalin's paranoia uh, further. Um, but it's not until you look at the same map um, less than a decade later, you can see the epic scale, the brilliance, if you like, of, of his plan. So he created this ring of steel that subsequently got, became known as the Iron Curtain, and that became the front line in the, in the Cold War. Um, but, you know, you compare that to the borders of the Soviet, the original Soviet Union uh, back in 1938, and you get to see just the sort of the, the geopolitical scale of his... Um, uh, influence, so basically taking uh, control of all these Eastern Bloc countries under his uh, patronage is perhaps one word, um, but it just gives you an idea of the sort of geo geopolitical nature of it all. And really only by looking at maps, you can appreciate just how uh, comprehensive that uh, uh, strategy was. So I'm constantly referring to maps when I'm writing. Um, uh, in books or on the walls in my office. I've got a big map of um, East Germany over there for my current project, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, or Google Maps. Google Maps is extraordinary. Um, very useful tool. Um, and I include as many as I can. And these are just, just uh, uh, five or so examples of the maps that appear in my work. And they really help to bring the narrative to life. That's the whole point of uh, of, of doing this. And they're not just in black and white. <laughs> so um, I've got uh, uh, colour maps as well in my work. And also I've been able, thank, again, thanks mainly to the various US archives to get some really good um, maps produced by the CIA and by the um, uh, US, um, US military um, in colour as well, which is quite good. So we talked about, you know, am I a, a historian? Am I a geographer? Well, Am I an archaeologist? It turns out that I am an I'm a conflict archaeologist. I didn't realise I was until I spoke to a real conflict archaeologist, a, a PhD student who's been doing some work with Bricksmiths. And I realised that I was pretty much doing the same as she was um, without the training and the fancy terminology, if you like. Um, as a researcher subject, I try to understand everything about it. Um, including recreating the scene in my mind, what's going on, sketches, diagrams, and that sort of stuff. And I, I realised this is a great way of getting across the story to the to the um, uh, reader, uh, much better than just pr prose. So a case in point is the story of the Portland Spies, and I'm sure um, you, you, you guys are all familiar with this story. Um, major spy stamp scandal from the 1960s, 1960 even. So we have Harry Horton, and his girlfriend, Ethel G. They were supplying secrets from their employers at the Admiralty Underwater Weapons Establishment in Portland, Dorset, as opposed to Portland, Oregon. Um, they were supplying them to their Soviet hander, handler, Gordon Lonsdale. And then he would regularly visit a New Zealand couple, Peter and Helen Kroger, at their bungalow in Ricelip, um, in, in uh, uh, London, or West London. Um, and obviously the, the, the British 
uh, viewers today might uh, be familiar with Ricelip, but um, uh, for people outside uh, outside the UK, Ricelip is a very um, dull um, backwater suburb. It's, it's it's commuter land, but it has a reputation, I think, for being uh, quite a sort of uh, a uh, not particularly exciting place. Um, but that's that, that, that probably why they uh, they chose it, as we'll as we'll soon see. So. Lonsdale was in reality uh, Conan Molody. He was a long term Soviet sleeper agent. Um, and one of the Krogers weren't actually the Krogers. They were Lona and Morris Cohen. They're Americans and they were his couriers. So as the net closed in on them, a chance discovery resulted in, in Special Branch and MI5 setting up an observation point in a house opposite uh, 45 Cranley Drive was there was the bungalow in right slip and a surveillance operation began that resulted in the rest of Lonsdale, Houghton and G in London and a dramatic raid on the Kroger's bungalow. So what I tried to do was understand why why right slip? Well, again, it's a place where they're not likely to uh, be noticed and the, the location of the bungalow. And I tried to try and re recreate the scene in my in my head. Why was it such a good base for espionage? So Google Maps, good old Google. Um, so the first first stage of this process is always to look at it in this format as a map. Um, and then you can look at the uh, satellite, uh, thankfully, and the um, that's the position of the observation points across the road. And obviously what you can see here, uh, the first thing you can see is that there was obviously a back escape route across this sports ground. And Cranley Drive here, you can see, is actually a dead end, although there's a, an alleyway there. So it's actually quite an interesting, well-chosen spot for a, uh, a clandestine operation. So then I go from the satellite view to street view, and there we have the bungalow. Um, which was quite a, it's quite a thrill finding that. I mean, it, it, it's obvious that it's there, but just the fact that I could click around on Google Maps and explore the scene of some pretty major um, espionage was quite quite fun. And you know, and if you're in any doubt, there's the uh, original bungalow. Um, it looks like they've had a bit of work, changed the roof line, and got rid of some chimneys, but that's the bungalow. So that was the bungalow. There was the house opposite. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Search in that house, and the, the OP was, was run from one of those upstairs bedrooms. There's the alleyway, and that alleyway was used by Lonsdale to uh, go back and forth from where he parked his car, which was here. And th th there you see the um, the bungalow, sorry, the, the um, alleyway. And this help this helps me understand really what's going Drew, on. Drew, I'm not sure that the slide has moved on. I'm still looking at the bungalow currently. There you go. That's great. Oh. Yeah. You happy with go that? Back. Uh, go back to the map. Okay. So Think. you've got... Yeah, go back. That, that's the um, alleyway, and then that's... that's yeah, the, great. Cool. Um, yeah, and so basically this is how it ended up in the book. So you've got the um, the bungalow, you've got the alleyway, You've got where he parked his car. And again, if you know the story, he um, he had a, a Studebaker, a, a really fancy American import car, which really wasn't the uh, probably the most sensible thing to do for a guy trying to um, uh, uh, operate a covert operation. But anyway, uh, that's history. And there are, there's the, um, the house for the OP. So just that little exercise really helped me understand what was going on and how Lonsdale operated with the Krogers and the, the the benefits of why they based themselves where they did. And then the operation that was used to observe them and then grab them. So there you go. <clears throat> Here are a couple of other reconstructions I, I, pull, I pulled together, um, my homemade archaeology. Um, so the, the one on the left there is the, um, uh, the detailed flight schematic of the Berlin airlift. Uh, and as you can see, um, at its height, it was an extremely complicated operation. And that shows the, the different um, air traffic control 
mechanisms used to control the uh, the routes in. Quick slurp of coffee. And on the right there, um, Checkpoint Bravo in, in Berlin, which is obviously the um, the link, the entrance to Berlin, to West Berlin, which links up with the road corridor going to Helmstedt um, it, uh, and uh, West Germany. Now, I didn't realise that the um, Checkpoint Bravo, sort of a baker as it originally was, um, moved and it moved um, from the position um, down on the canal up to by the checkpoint and there was the whole story around why it it had to move but i just did some research into um the geography and you can understand uh from photographs and from uh uh contemporary maps what was going on and i recreated it on this uh this map here and then lastly here's a recreation of the um the checkpoint charlie confrontation in October 61 between the Americans and Soviets. I wanted to try and understand where, the, how close the Soviets were from the, uh, you know, the two sides were from each other, and where some of the other vehicles were um, standing off, if you like. So um, the famous scene as seen on the left here was one aspect of it. But as you can see, there was a, there was, there was tanks positioned all along the uh, Friedrichstrasse, um, or sorry, Zimmerstrasse um, section there. So again, another sort of um, recreation, um, all to help me understand what's going on and therefore the reader um, to, to, to pass the information to them. Um, so it turns out I was a conflict archeologist all along and didn't know it um, with apologies to any real conflict ar archeologists out there. So, um, but there you go. So. Am I a graphic artist? Well, again, in my former career as a marketing man, I commissioned thousands of pieces of artwork, but I always got other people to do it for me. Um, so in the, my new career as a nonfiction author, um, I can't call on people to do that work for me. So I've had to reinvent myself as a bit of a graphic artist. Um, I never got around to learning Illustrator or Photoshop. My, my, my chosen weapon is PowerPoint, would you believe? But I've got quite creative about how I can use PowerPoint. Um, so Again, you've probably seen that I think very visually. Well, similarly, I, I like to create graphics that get the, get the, uh, the message across. So, oops, sorry, went a bit fast there. So here's um, one example. This is a, um, a recreation of the infamous death strip. And this is all produced in PowerPoint, would you believe? And here we have a, a, a series of schematics showing the uh, configuration of the famous Berlin Tunnel that um, uh, the uh, CIA and SIS tapped in the 1950s to um, get the Soviet telephone calls. Again, I wanted to try and understand the the, the geography, the um, even the engineering side of the, the project. And uh, I, I pulled together these schematics to help me understand it and help. Andrew, I'm not sure we can see the schematic at the moment of the uh the berlin tunnel can you, what can you see now uh i'm looking at the death strip okay that's really weird yeah no i can see it now great you don't know see, why there's a delay that? but anyway yeah, the, we're good yeah a, we can see there's, it. there's, there's a, a strange lag between what i'm seeing on my screen and what you guys are seeing so Anyway. Uh, it may be me, actually, because uh, Thomas has commented that there's no delay. So I was just shut up. OK. Yeah, shut up. Anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, so I had the original CIA reports and I had uh, photos from the, the Soviets took when they discovered it in uh, 1956. And I had photos, a few photos, not very good ones, um, from the CIA. And I just basically pulled, uh, you know, recreated it in my own mind and created these graphics. And I, I, I really think it helps helps me understand what's going on. And here's another one. This is the um, a simulated release of a nuclear weapon uh, from a Soviet Su-17 fitter jet. Um, and this is using the LABS, the Labs Low Altitude Bombing System technique. 
and this was a, um, a, a recreation of a, a sketch made by a Bricksmith tour officer in September 1971. And um, he was able to, as you can see here down on the left, he was able to sort of sit and observe this um, attack profile and he sketched it all out and then worked it all out. The, um, you know, the even the time difference between this, the sound, um, you, know, you know, the speed of sound and all that sort of stuff. And I've recreated the graphic here um, for use in the book. So I, I think visually as well as uh, in words, basically. But speaking of visual visuals, um, a lot of time is an effort is spent on researching images to use in the books. So so maps and uh, graphics are one thing, but images are very important to uh, nonfiction, as, I, as I'm sure you will all appreciate. Um, what you may not realize, though, is that most authors are responsible for sorting all their own images. So unless you're a Max Hastings or a Ben McIntyre, um, you know, bringing in the big bucks, um, they've probably got picture editors working for them or they have access to Getty or Alami or one of these big picture libraries. But unfortunately, um, the costs of those sorts of services are well beyond us mere mortals. So we have to rely on our own search skills um, and, and the incredible generosity of these enthusiasts around the world that I've mentioned. Uh, and they're prepared to share uh, images from their personal collections to help uh, struggling authors like myself. So just just selection of images, but the, the process of uh, researching images, making sure you've got the rights to use them um, is uh, a very time consuming uh, task. Um, sometimes it's a bit soul destroying, but uh, then, then you find yourself a, a gem of an image like some of these ones here. Um, and um, that makes up for the, uh, <laughs> the pain. Uh, but also it's sometimes down to luck. So again, I think probably the, the, the audience today is be well familiar with the story of Oleg Pinkowski and um, Greville Wynne, his hapless courier, recruited by MI6 to look after the Soviet spy um, as depicted by Benedict Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch in the 2020 film, The Courier little inset there of him. Um, Wynne often entertained Penkovsky and members of his delegation and all sorts of um, uh, interesting characters at his home in Upper Chain Row in Chelsea, that's London. Um, so there's a story about, um, I relate in the book, that's quite a well-known one, that um, both Wynne and Penkovsky got together and they both put a claim to their respective spy masters, so SIS in the case of Wynne, uh, GRU in the case of Penkovsky, uh, to put a bar in um, Greville Wynne's house to facilitate entertaining contacts, if you like, um, more like entertaining themselves, but that was the uh, the ruse they did. Both um, spy agencies coughed up their 500 quid each, so they had a thousand pounds, which was an awful lot in 1960 um, or whenever it was, um, and there's more enough than to, to build the bar, but also to spend a load of money on booze and other fast living, shall we say. Um, so clicking around the, doing my research, I stumbled on a 2015 article in the Guardian newspaper about the sale of 19 Upper Chain Row. It was up for £6 million, which is quite a lot for a house anyway, um, and how it had retained a lot of its original features. And just clicking through the article, I saw this the bar. And as you can see in the image here, it's clearly the original bar that was built uh, back back in the day. Um, so I contacted the estate agent who was selling it, selling, selling the property, and they sort of looked back in their records. They put me in touch with the photographer who gave me permission to use the image, which I've included in the book. Um, and all he wanted in return was a, a, a copy of the book uh, for himself and a credit. So sometimes it's quite nice to uh, you, you just stumble on a, a lucky break, if you like. Um, so am I an artist? Well, actually, I know I'm not an artist. I've got no artistic talent as such, even though I spent years working in the uh, 
artist material industry. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, but there are lots of great artists out there. So in my Hellion books in particular, we use a lot of color illustrations to support the text. So we've got a network of artists all over the world who um, uh, pull these together. These are mostly digitally created. Um, the image, these, this little selection here is, is produced by guys in Austria, in Italy, and even Bosnia Herzegovina, um, would you believe? And um, so we've got, you know, the, these really very nice and, and very um, carefully researched uh, sort of uh, original images that are used in the books. Um, the vehicles tend to come from a guy in France who's uh, very uh, well versed in these vehicle in, in the, these vehicles. And the soldier illustrations we use in the books, uh, they come from artists in Brazil, would you believe? Um, rather than produced digitally, these are actually produced with pencil and uh, watercolor and gouache. And they're, you know, they're, they're actually pa pa painted um, and then scanned and sent, uh, sent across. Um, crack it, amazing results. I'm absolutely, you know, love seeing these images come together. Um, so whether it's an aircraft, a vehicle, a uniform, or even the insignia you see down the bottom, every aspect of it's very carefully re um, researched, because basically we, we want to make sure it's authentic. Um, and, you know, it, it's down to every buckle, every button, belt, pocket, pouch, holster, weapon, all the details we really sort of pick over. Um, because in some cases, the um, we can actually establish a, a link with the people uh, who, who's who, who's in the image. And I know a lot of veterans also um, read the books. And, um, you know, I think it's out, out of respect to them that um, we spend a lot of time on accuracy. So th these are great fun to put together. So what's up next? What am I working on, on uh, at the moment? I've got a long list of projects in the pipeline and that's going to keep me busy for years. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, chuffed to bits that I can uh, spend my time doing this work. Um, as I mentioned, volume three in the Cold War Berlin uh, miniseries for Hellion will be out next month. Um, it's the um, volume three and four are both on the US garrison in Berlin. Um, and so the, the, the volume three, the, the first of the, of the pair, if you like, that comes out next month. The second will be out later this year. I've, I've finished it. It's just they, they're going to, uh, you know, schedule it in later in the year. And then I've got another half dozen or so titles in the series that, that's lined up. But the project I'm working on at the moment is a is the first of two commissions on Bricksmiths, the, um, the British mission to the Soviet force in Germany. Um, this is for Pen and Sword, and I know Bricksmiths is a, a, a favourite topic of uh, the Cold War Conversations uh, audience. Uh, the first is a history of the unit um, and the story of their adventures and all sorts of exciting stuff, gathering intelligence inside the former East Germany, and that will be out uh, next year. Um, and the others are to come down the line. So that is enough of me waffling away. Um, Thank you for listening. Um, just wanted to say that the, the nice people at Pen and Sword have given you guys um, a special discount code if you wanted to pick up a copy of Secrets of the Cold War. Um, if you use that code, and Ian said he's going to pop it in the um, you know um, emails and show notes or whatever, um, but um, that's a, a, a good price off the off the RRP, and uh, that's valid until the third of April. So if, if you if you want to go ahead, by all means. Um, that's very nice of them to do that. They're, they're fans of the podcast too. So um, that's good. So that's it from me for, you know, um, presenting stuff. But if you if there's stuff that you want to uh, ask me about, I'm all ears. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Really fascinating insight into the uh, creative process there and i never knew that powerpoint could be used so well so uh well, nor did i until i have to <laughs> yeah yeah and i love the story of greville wins bar actually i love the fact they managed to charge both um oh, yeah. intelligence services for that but anyway less from me uh people who have questions if you want to ask it in person uh there should be an option uh to do that but uh, if you want to ask it via 
uh, chat, then feel free to put your question in the chat and uh, Andrew uh, will answer that whilst uh, people are, uh, are gathering their, their thoughts there. Um, Andrew, I, I, one of the things that um, always in, in, intrigues me, and you sort of touched on it, is sourcing these photos. So while there are a number of sort of like free libraries that you can use for, for this sort of stuff? Um, the US, Nas US National Archives are really good for this type of thing. The um, quality of the images online is just about good enough to be used in, pu in publication. Um, some cases it's a bit mar marginal, but you can apply to have high res image images sent, but that costs money and you know sort of like ten pound an image when you think I think there's something like one hundred and thirty odd images in one of my in the, one of the hellion books um you know you start paying ten pound a um an image you know that's like I don't know how many years of royalty payments. If, if that, you know, you, you can yeah. quickly wipe, wipe out any any possible um, uh, return on the book. So U.S. National Archives are brilliant. Um, other places, the um, the Allied Museum in Berlin, they, they've got a fantastic um, image resource. And in fact, there's a, a mob called Museums Digital Berlin, where all the different museums, not just the um, Allied Museum, um, but all the museums in, in Berlin have come together to create this digital um, sort of vault, if you like. Um, but yeah, there, there are places like that you find. I've also got a, a chap in France um, who um, can help me with loads of images. Um, and he's got links with Hanoi uh, in Vietnam and the military museum there. And so therefore stuff that's Eastern Bloc related um, was shared quite freely amongst the um, the sort of the communist uh, world, if you like, and so he he he's supplied some remarkable images of, for me um, via bizarrely uh, Hanoi and Paris. Um, but yeah, you just got to really um, dig around, and every now and then you hit a gold seam, and you, you're lucky. And other times you can be, you know, banging your head against the screen. But yeah, yeah, wow. Well, you've almost got your own international intelligence service, I have. sort of like the spider's web, where you're <laughs> at the uh, the uh, the centre of it. Now, we have got a couple of questions. First one's from Paul uh, Nipras. And, oh, hi, um, hi, Paul. It's, uh, uh, which part of the Berlin story do you find intriguing and why? When I was... Um, <laughs> The original research project, if you like, this is before I, I got as far as books, was the Cold War. And it was I wanted to try and understand what the whole what the Cold War was. And what happened was almost every corner I turned in, in the in the research um, was a road leading to Berlin. You know, and sort of Berlin is such a, a, a hub for the Cold War. I'm just reading Max Hastings book. Um, that he, he came on the podcast about um, the abyss. Uh, I'm actually really enjoying the book. It's um, probably a lot easier to read than listen to the podcast, to be honest. Because um, yeah, he's um, but he he was very um, you know, very entertaining on the podcast. But the book is really really well written, um, and um, yeah, that constantly refers to Berlin. It's a book about the Cuban Cuban, Cuban missile crisis, but you know, um, Berlin's referred to almost every other page. So I realised that Berlin was really very important to um, the Cold War. And, and that's really where this whole Ireland city, Cold War Berlin um, idea came from. And um, the thing that I find, I think, most interesting about it is the, the epic scale of it, the, um, the, um, well, I suppose the um, yeah the the, the 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 huge industrial scale that the wall became. You know, it's not just a, a wall that you're talking about a massive hinterland and a ridiculous amount of technology, um, all designed to keep the population in rather than the enemies getting across. It's a, a, a remarkable thing. So I, I, I'm very much intrigued as to the 
um, epic scale of it. And also, I think just the the brutality of it as well. Um, the fact that um, they felt it was necessary to to do that um, to, to their people and how that then links into the the wider communist experiment, if you like, um, uh, and uh, perhaps why the, uh, the people weren't that excited about what their glorious leaders wanted to do with their, their lives. So really, um, yeah, I think just the sort of scale of it. And um, I think I've talked about, you know, when I was, I went and saw the wall, I know Ian, Ian had a similar experience. You can't help but being a bit awestruck by it, um, just how how sort of um, bleak and dismal and, and scary it was, really. So that's why I, I find that interesting. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Andrew. I think that probably echoes a lot of our listeners' fascination mm. with Berlin. As uh, people notice, I'm always <laughs> drawn back to another episode on Berlin or, or East Germany, but uh, it's an endless subject that keeps giving. Um, so we've also got a question from Matthew Comstock. So it's, have you Hi, uncovered Matthew. anything in, in your research that goes against our conventional understanding of the Cold War? Maybe something that makes you rethink how you perceive a certain topic. That's a good question. Um, I think I'm constantly, obviously, I, I interpret what I see in my own, with my own eyes. And I, I write about it as I, as I see it, if you like. Um, there hasn't I, I haven't i haven't had any silver bullets any sort of like um uh, eureka moments because the the subject matter is pretty well um covered um now you know we're not like uh the second world war or you know books about hitler or books about um spitfires that are, you know are all over the place um the cold war is is still you could say a fairly untapped market so there is um a lot to be said about a lot to be told about about the cold war i like to look at it in a certain way and i've, I've sort of described how i go about that um and i'm really observing it as i'm seeing it you know i'm not, I'm not a I don't have an agenda really apart from just trying to tell what is a very interesting story um and then all throughout it there are I'm, I'm learning new things and i suppose because i'm i've got a library a bit like ian's uh library behind him there um but i'm finding stuff that i haven't come across before all the time so if i haven't come across it and i'm not saying that i am the uh, uh the oracle of all knowledge but it means it's a fair bet that you know i'm I, i'm reasonably well read on the subject and if it's new to me well hopefully it'll be new to the people who are, who are buying my books um so yeah I, I i can't think of a particular nugget apart from perhaps uh the uh breville wins bar but anyway um yeah no i can't think of anything uh, you know really that's um screaming at me but just the whole approach i'm trying to take is um tell the story in a way that is um very presentable and accessible oh, thank thank you for that andrew and if people have got any other questions do post them in the comments um i mean it, it's interesting what what you were saying there andrew because i think for for me it's the little details that get teased out of conversations with people that i find fascinating and that's probably one of the biggest pleasures that i get out of doing the podcast is hearing somebody describe something and just not having no realization that that was the situation or that's how they understood mm. the situation or or you know the how they felt at that moment in time you know think mm. things that are a little bit more visceral than a fact or you know yeah. the, uh, a politician's uh view, viewpoint I think um, if some some of the the stuff I talk about in the books is quite operational, and it's not necessarily un well understood the machinations, the infrastructure that that, that needed to go into maintaining um, this in this in the case of the Berlin books, 
maintaining that island city, um, the the stuff that that had to go on in the background to uh, make it happen. So, for example, um, I, the this new book coming out, um, Volume Three, um, understanding how do you run a garrison of American soldiers um, where you are complete had to be completely self sufficient, and so therefore it's very unlike any other military unit um, because it is so unusual and um, how they go about uh, running it and how they go about maintaining the peace that's that's the whole uh, aspect of volume three and, and volume four is about how they went about preparing for war and what's so unusual about the Berlin situation is that of course they had to have everything with them they couldn't rely on being resupplied. They couldn't rely on reinforcements coming in. They had to plan and train within this um, very discreet area. And that's really unusual. And, that, and so that, um, I think perhaps um, what uh, Paul's question uh, 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 sort of alludes to is understanding some of these um, behind the scenes type things should be quite interesting uh, reading for the audience. That's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in your style, you, you do bring it alive. I mean, you know, some subjects can be quite dry. Logistics is never perhaps the most exciting uh, subject for people. They want more the tanks and the fighting and, and, and stuff like that. But without that, nothing happens. And Berlin well, yeah. is a great example of exactly. how key that is, keeping those corridors open, whether they're air or land or rail hmm. corridors. And, well, um, you know, how long they can sustain if they're cut off. Yeah. In, in, the, in the new book, um, I, I talk a lot about the, um, the, the transit because that, that's, as you say, it's core to the, uh, the garrison. You know, everybody would have either come up, driven across or come on the duty train or flown into Tempelhof. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, and I, again, lucked out by finding a, a guy who, used to work in the RTO, the Rail Transit Office, uh, Rail, Trans Rail Transportation Office um, in, in the 60s. And he um, he was a really good photographer as well. And he took some amazing pictures of Berlin. Um, I've got pictures of the, um, uh, the um, what do they call them? Uh, the American version of Operation Rocking Horse, um, where they basically do an emergency deployment um, out of barracks to various places. I've got all photos of, of these emergency deployments and also um, demonstrations, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations, and also um, lots of pictures of the rail transportation stuff. But of course, the rail, um, each and every transit of the um, rail and road corridor was a potential flashpoint. So they had to plan for a potential confrontation and they had to have the communications. They had to have the uh, resources to, 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 to cope with that. So, yeah, even a boring old train journey is a, a, an interesting Cold War story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I did that interview with General Sir Robert Corbett and mm. his uh, first train journey was. Yeah, uh, yeah particularly um interesting um now andrew we've got one last question so madeleine has asked has hello uh the world's view of the cold war changed since you've been working on it has you or the world's view of the cold war changed since you've been working on it um yes in the sense that um the cold war is a lot more relevant um, than I thought it was. <laughs> I thought it was a, um, you know, a, an int it was in my life, a, a, a chunk of it was in my lifetime, uh, which is obviously why I find it quite interesting. But obviously the, what's going on across um, in Ukraine at the moment and uh, Putin's role in that and Putin's role as a KGB officer um, um, in Dresden on the, in, in, at the fall of the Berlin Wall and therefore his his complete, uh, his training, his methodology um, to become a KGB officer. Um, once a Czechist, always a Czechist, they say. Um, so, you know, it's it's very relevant. And there's something else also. Robert Corbett, you mentioned, he, he was kind enough to write the foreword um, for Secrets of the Cold War. He, he's a lovely chap. 
I met him down here in Cornwall. He came down with his wife and uh, he took us out for a drink. Um, but he's a really fascinating bloke to talk to as per your um, thing. And also uh, Major, Major General Peter Williams, who's the uh, chairman of the Bricksmiths Association. He's a big s supporter of mine. Um, and I've spoken to them, both of them, about Ukraine and how um, one of the interesting things was um, back in the Cold War, um, there were things in place through the, 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 the military missions to have a very high level dialogue direct with the Soviet opposite number. So you had, um, you know, the commander in chief of the G GSFG, the Group of Soviet Forces Germany, talking directly to the commander in chief of uh, the, the of BAOR, RAF Germany, US um, and, and the French uh, um, armies as well. And that dialogue helped diffuse a lot of situations before they sort of elevated to a sort of political level where all sorts of things can then happen. Um, now that dialogue was maintained throughout the Cold War and it was uh, maintained up until certainly the early, early 1990s. That dialogue now doesn't exist. There's no mechanism to have that same um, dialogue. And so you know, you've got lessons that were made in the Cold War that haven't been carried forward into the modern uh, geopolitical environment, if you like. So certainly I think the, um, the Cold War is very relevant. Um, certainly looking back at um, how Stalin um, and his successors approached their, um, their, their world view, if you like, um, has a lot of bearings on today's uh, ge geopolitical strife, if you like. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to understand these these stories because they, they they are relevant and solutions and approaches that were taken back in the day that basically the Cold War was, um, you know, luckily didn't go hot. Um, it, it, yes, there was a lot of regional conflict, but the, 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 the big conflict was was avoided through all kinds of different means. And I think that Obviously, less lessons need to be learnt uh, in today's uh, situation. So, yeah, it's uh, it's all very relevant. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Kept the Cold War cold. That yeah, some exactly. of those um, organisations that that you mentioned there. Um, well, Andrew, I just want to say thank you for coming on this uh, first Meet the Guests episode for our financial supporters of Cold War Conversations really appreciate it and uh look forward to uh working with you again on a on another episode or two yeah no i i've been very happy to 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 talk to you guys and you know hello all you, all of you listeners thank you for that and thank you for supporting the podcast and um keeping the cold war conversation going it's um you, you know obviously you can tell i'm a big fan of the podcast but also of the subject area and i um i i enjoy listening to and learning from you know every podcast I listen to, every episode I listen to, I learn more. So I, I, I enjoy it.